I'm back, baby. And this time with a Japanese whiskey. Hello and welcome to another installment of Behind the Glass with a Glass. I'm Nick Carver and uh, I think it's been like seven months since I've done one of these. So my brain is absolutely bursting at the seams with words that I want to throw at your face. Um, so we're going to dive into it. But before we talk photography, let me tell you what I'm sipping here. This is Hibiki Japanese Harmony Whiskey. And this is the first Japanese whiskey I've reviewed on this channel. Uh, in fact, it's the first Japanese whiskey I've owned, I believe. Uh, actually, it might be the second. But this was a gift from somebody. So uh, thank you, friend, for this uh, lovely gift. And um, Hibiki Japanese whiskey, or the Japanese Harmony whiskey, will run you 75 to 90 US dollars. That's what I'm seeing online right now. At the rate inflation is going, it's probably going to be 300 by next week. But um, not a super cheap bottle of whiskey. Uh, now, on the Habiki website, um, it says the palate has a honey-like sweetness, candied orange peel with white chocolate. And, uh, you know, I'm really not good at detecting individual flavors in a, uh, a beverage, but after reading that, I definitely taste the, the honey-like sweetness for sure, and I think I get a little bit of that white chocolate. Um, the best way I could describe this whiskey is... Uh, complex in a good way uh, it kind of sinks in the more you drink it and it tastes better and better the more you drink it in fact the first time I took a sip today uh, it'd been a little while since I had any and the first sip I took it was like whoa ooh, and then it started sinking in and it was like okay this is good this is interesting um, so complex I really like how it kind of uh, evolves as you drink it more and you can start to pick up more of the subtle flavors as you go but it's actually it's really good whiskey um, I'm more of a bourbon guy typically but uh, this is uh, right up there with like Blanton's my favorite bourbon um, so very very good I do recommend it if you're willing to uh, you know drop 75 to 90 dollars on a bottle of whiskey Yeah. Now, whiskey aficionados, which I am not, might want to punch me in the face for this. I don't know if I'm completely off base by saying this, but it strikes me more as a scotch. That's why the first sip I took was kind of like, ooh, because I'm not that into scotches. But uh, once that initial um, sip sets in, uh, it's quite delicious. I don't know if there's any connection to scotch. I don't know if it's supposed to be peaty or if peat moss is involved at all. Maybe I'm just an idiot who doesn't know anything about whiskey. Most likely that, but um, I will say it's kind of like a scotch and that the first sip might hit you a little hard, um, but then it, it gets a little better. All right, so let's talk photography. And there's two things I want to talk about today. Uh, first is a new project I'm working on, and then I want to talk some kind of deep philosophical uh, stuff I've been mulling over over the past couple weeks and um, this may drag on a while because I got a lot of thoughts but uh, it's probably going to be cut short by the fact that I turned off the AC so that the audio wasn't insane and I'm going to start sweating here before too long it is July after all um, so first things first um, I am working on a new project that I am super freaking excited about you probably won't share the same excitement, and that's okay, but uh, I do really well in photography if I have a project to direct me. Uh, in other words, if I'm working on a series of photos or I have a specific subject I'm studying. Um, it always sounds pretentious to say I'm, I've been studying this, uh, this subject for a while now. Um, but if I have something that's kind of steering my photography, I do a lot better because it keeps me focused. It gives me something to be excited about, about the next photo. It's much better than just if I just head out into the world and, hey, I'm going to take pictures today. I'd much rather have something kind of steering me. So that's where a lot of the excitement comes from on this project. But I also just think it's a really cool project. So here's what it is. Um, 
throughout Orange County here, uh, throughout California, and in fact, I'm learning throughout the entire country, uh, there are a bunch of businesses occupying buildings that are remarkably similar. Um, they all have uh, three arched windows out front, an arched parapet up top, with a hole up in that arched parapet that seems to have held a bell at one point. That's right, they were old Taco Bells. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, Taco Bell uh, had this building design for all of their locations that they kept consistent across all their locations. And it's very kind of um, late 70s, early 80s look. And um, eventually Taco Bell moved on from that design. They didn't want to use that building anymore. Uh, so there were all these vacant buildings. They didn't bulldoze all of them. Sometimes they moved the Taco Bell down the road and just built a brand new building. So um, over the years and over the decades, other businesses have moved into these old Taco Bell buildings. And uh, every time I see one, um, it's super obvious that it was a Taco Bell. Even if they took the arched parapet down, you can still tell it was a Taco Bell. Um, and so my project now is I want to photograph uh, a bunch of these old Taco Bell buildings. And I'm calling it Previously Taco Bell. In fact, uh, I even secured the domain name. Head on over to previouslytacobell.com to check out uh, the pictures I've taken so far and if you want to follow along as I take more photos. Um, but uh, I just want to photograph the ones that strike my fancy. And uh, I'm going to do it, of course, on film. 6x17, 4x5 large format. I'll probably do some 120 as well on the RZ67. Whatever format suits the subject. Now the first three pictures I've taken so far are all on 6x17. I did not set out to do that. I actually wanted to start with 4x5. Um, but uh, the subjects just so happened to call for 6x17. So it's probably going to be a lot of 6x17 in there. Um, but uh, let me share with you the first three photos that I have. So the very first one I took was actually in Tustin, a city right next door. This is a shuttered um, Taco Bell. And um, this one, it's, it's very fitting that this was the first one I shot um, because turns out the architect of these buildings is from Tustin. I didn't know that. Uh, but the first one I shot was in Tustin. And then uh, there's a couple more down the street from here. Uh, there's, there's like a lot in Orange County. A um, couple more down the street here, a subway uh, that I shot, and um, that one came out pretty cool. Uh, and then another one, which is a, a teriyaki joint now, um, which uh, I'm pretty happy with all three. I think I'm off to a good start. They got the vibe I want, um, and uh, I'm really excited to shoot more of them. Now, uh, I, did, I came up with this idea all on my own. Uh, nothing gave me this idea. I was just driving around and noticing these Taco Bells, and then it kind of hit me one day. But I'll admit, I am definitely not the first one to come up with this idea. Uh, in fact, there's a whole subreddit for previous Taco Bells where people share pictures of previous Taco Bells. And that's been a huge resource for me. I actually went through that subreddit and noted down every Taco Bell I could find um, that other people have identified. And I put that into a spreadsheet. I got a nice spreadsheet going of like 30 previous Taco Bells. Surprisingly, there's a, quite a few uh, noted down in Oklahoma. So maybe I'll be heading out to Oklahoma at some point to work more on this project. Um, so I got a spreadsheet going. And uh, if you spot a previous Taco Bell in your area, I would love to hear about it. Please email me at uh, mail at previouslytacobell.com. I can't believe I had to look at my notes for that. I should know that email off the top of my head. Mail at previouslytacobell.com um, or email me through my normal channels. They're all going to the same inbox. <clears throat> And also, follow me on Instagram, at Previously Taco Bell. I'm going to be posting these pictures there. You can follow the progress there, and you can DM me there if you find a Taco Bell. Basically, I want to know if there's a previous Taco Bell in your area so I can add it to my spreadsheet, and then maybe, if it strikes my fancy, if the conditions are just right, I'll go out and photograph it and add it to this collection. Now, my goal is to one day have a collection of images worthy of a book and then I'll put together a book called Previously Taco Bell. Um, but no promises on that yet, because uh, I don't know, maybe I'll get tired of this project four pictures in and I'll just uh, ditch it. It could always happen. Um, but anyway, that's the project I'm working on. I'm excited about it. 
I hope you'll follow me on Instagram. I hope you'll check out my website to see the pictures even bigger because Instagram's not exactly ideal for sharing six by 17 photos. But um, yeah, I'm excited. So I'm gonna keep pursuing it. Um, but on to topic two. And I hope you'll uh, forgive me for looking at my phone. Um, my brain is really good at thoughts, but not so good at memory. Um, you know, they say a goldfish has a, a memory of three seconds. I'm not kidding. I think mine is less than that. It drives my wife insane. I'm actually, it got so bad recently that I've started playing a game on my iPhone to try and improve my memory. My score never goes up. Kind of sucks. I feel like I have early onset Alzheimer's. But topic two, let's talk about it. So I've been reading this book recently, Zero to One by uh, Peter Thiel. And Peter Thiel is a uh, billionaire venture capitalist. He was one of the co-founders of PayPal. And in the course of reading this book, I had a mirror held up to my face. And uh, I don't think I liked what was looking back at me. <sighs> there is a section in here that I want to share with you because uh, it was a little bit revealing and kind of made me think a little bit about what I'm doing with um, analog photography, believe it or not. Uh, but he has a section here called Secrets, and this has been my favorite chapter so far. Um, and he kind of starts off the chapter basically positing the question, why aren't people looking for secrets? Um, he says, most people act as if there are no secrets left to find. And uh, he'll explain a bit here. Um, but he says, uh, an extreme representative of this view is Ted Kaczynski, infamously known as the Unabomber. That's right, we're gonna talk about Ted Kaczynski. Um, so Ted Kaczynski, for those of you who don't know, he was a, a domestic terrorist in the US that uh, bombed a bunch of universities. That's where UNA comes from and Unabomber. Um, bombed a bunch of universities and an airline and he even bombed the uh, CEO of, I think it was United Airlines. Um, but he was an interesting guy because he was a, like a child prodigy in math. Uh, he went to Harvard at 16 and got his PhD in math and uh, became a pre professor at UC Berkeley. Uh, super smart guy. Um, and uh, when he was doing all these bombings, no one knew who was doing it, obviously. But he had put out this uh, 35,000 word manifesto uh, to the press. Uh, he anonymous, anonymously mailed it to the press. That was ultimately his undoing. His brother recognized his, his uh, writing style and uh, tipped off the, uh, the FBI. Um, but uh, Peter Thiel, in his book here, says, you might expect that writing style of his 35,000 word manifesto to have shown obvious signs of insanity, but the manifesto is eerily cogent. Kaczynski claimed that in order to be happy, every individual, quote, needs to have goals whose attainment requires effort and needs to succeed in, att in attaining at least some of his goals. I agree with that. So uh, let it be known. Nick Carver agrees with Ted Kaczynski. Goes on to say, um, he divided human goals into three groups. One, goals that can be satisfied with minimal effort. Two, goals that can be satisfied with serious effort. And three, goals that cannot be satisfied no matter how much effort one makes. That also makes perfect sense to me. So again, Nick Carver agrees with Ted Kaczynski. Peter Thiel goes on to say, um, that's the, this is the classic trichotomy of the easy, the hard, and the impossible. Kaczynski argued that modern people are depressed because all the world's hard problems have already been solved. Kind of makes sense to me too. I can see the argument for that. I may not agree with it 100%, but kind of makes sense to me. What's left to do is either easy or impossible, and pursuing those tasks is deeply unsatisfying. What you can do, even a child can do. What you can't do, even Einstein couldn't have done. So, um, he's basically just making the argument, both Ted Kaczynski and Peter Thiel, I guess, that uh, we live in such a comfortable world because of technology and advancements and everything else, it can feel like everything has been accomplished, everywhere has been explored, and there's nothing left to do except the really easy stuff or the impossible stuff. Um, and pursuing easy things is not satisfying, and pursuing impossible things is obviously not satisfying. I agree with all of that. But this is where insane 
uh, domestic terrorists kind of go off the rails um, because the uh, prescription for the diagnosis gets a little nutty. So Kaczynski's idea was to destroy existing institutions. Get rid of all technology and let people start over and work on hard problems anew. You hear that and it's kind of like, oh, you were so close. You almost had it. Uh, I felt the same way when I read the, uh, uh, the Communist Manifesto. Um, you know, Karl Marx, he laid out a lot of very compelling arguments in there and it's kind of like you're reading it, you're like, I'm not supposed to agree with this, but I kind of agree with everything he's saying. Um, but then he gets to the diagnosis and it's like, or the, the, uh, the prescription for the problem and it's like, ooh, you lost me. Um, suddenly it gets very murderous. Uh, but anyway, so uh, Kaczynski's methods were crazy, but his loss of faith in the technological frontier is all around us. And uh, this is where I had the mirror held up to me that I didn't like so much. Consider the trivial but revealing hallmarks of urban hipsterdom. Faux vintage photography? <laughs> How dare you, Peter Thiel? Uh, the handlebar mustache and vinyl record players all hark back to an earlier time when people were still optimistic about the future. If everything worth doing has already been done, you may as well feign an allergy to achievement and become a barista. Uh, shots have been fired by uh, Peter Thiel, and uh, I think I, I caught some of the shrapnel. Um, it's also got a funny drawing in here of the uh, original sketch of the Unabomber, like the FBI sketch, and then uh, a good old hipster with his uh, uh, big frame glasses and his, in his hood. Uh, and then finally he says, all fundamentalists think this way, not just terrorists and hipsters. Um, I found that passage pretty funny. But anyway, why am I bringing that up and what the hell does it have to do with photography? So, um, you know, when he pointed that out, that hipsters kind of have this vibe. I don't identify as a hipster. I don't like to be called a hipster. But I got to admit, I'm shooting analog film. I, I couldn't really fault someone for calling me a hipster. Now, it made me think, this is where the mirror was held up, am I really shooting film for the look and the workflow and the, and the process? Am I really, is that really why I'm shooting film? Or um, do I just yearn for a time uh, when it felt like the future had endless possibilities? Do I wear a full brim hat because I, I yearn for a time in the late 1800s when it's like, the open frontier and America was growing and there was nothing but opportunity ahead of us. Maybe in 2022, I'm feeling like uh, it's all been done, you know? And uh, I wish I could just teleport back to a time when there were more uh, opportunities. I don't know. I really do think I like the look of film. <laughs> I, I really do like the process. I like the workflow, I like the cameras. So I think those are all true. But I have to be honest with myself. There must be a bit of me that likes old timey stuff. I live in a house from 1924 for Christ's sake. Like, I must like these things because I think that might have been a slightly better time. I don't know. Um, maybe that's something I'll work out. Maybe, maybe I won't. Maybe I don't need to work it out. Maybe it's fine. But what does this have to do with photography really? Um, my feeling is, if secrets are dead, as Peter Thiel claims, or claims people think. If secrets are dead, digital photography is holding the bloody knife. <sighs> yeah, it's a self-satisfied sniff right there. Um, digital photography, I think, has played a massive role in this feeling of like, uh, you know, there's no secrets left. And I don't just mean for us photographers. I just mean the fact that everyone is carrying around a phone on their hip uh, has removed a lot of the um, secrecy from the world. Think about it, every distant place, every possible event has been photographed. I saw a video online the other day, it was a, a guy obviously at work who put a bottle rocket on the ground, aimed towards a bathroom, lit it off, it shot under the door and exploded in the bathroom where his coworker was obviously taking a dump. One of the funniest things I've ever seen, but I sure didn't know that was a, a possible thing to have happened before I saw that video. Um, so that's something that I'm not gonna be able to explore one day. Um, but also, you know, you wanna see what it looks like from the top of Mount Everest? 
You don't need to go. Just Google it. There's, I'm sure, a 360 degree view. Someone brought up one of those cameras where you can pan around and get a 360 degree view. Like every distant place, every possible event has been displayed to you. Um, so what does this all mean for us as photographers? Uh, and like, why am I talking about this at all on a photography channel? This kind of connects to my previously Taco Bell project that I've started on. Um, I, when I first had this idea uh, of previously Taco Bell, when it first struck me, I was super excited. I, I was so excited to start this project and I had that feeling of like, I found something. And, and I got something to do for a while now. And then my second thought was, don't Google it, because I was so afraid that I would find out another photographer had already done it. And I was afraid that I would find a subreddit already for this. Because I've had that feeling before where I have this photography project in mind or this photo I wanna take. And then I find out someone already did it not that long ago and maybe even better than I was planning on doing it. This is really difficult with photography because sometimes it can feel like every photo that could have been done has been done. Like I saw some figure once like 10 years ago. So this is a while ago. It's probably worse now. I saw some figure like there are more photos uploaded every minute to the internet than were taken in the entire 20th century uh, or something like that. I don't know what the exact numbers were, but there are so many freaking photos taken. There are so many freaking photographers. It's easy to get uh, into this rut personally. I'm not talking for everyone, maybe it's just me, but I can get into this rut where I feel like there's nothing left to do. There, there's nothing left to photograph. I have nothing new to offer the world. It's just gonna be variations on something that's already been done. Half the time, probably a worse variation. So what's the point? And then that can send me into a pretty deep slump where it's like, why am I doing this? Why am I a photographer? What's the point of it all? And then, I don't know, I just feel like I need to bomb a university or an airplane. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, NSA. I'm joking. Please don't tag me on the keyword bomb. Um, but imagine being a photographer in Ansel Adams' day. Now, don't get me wrong. Ansel Adams was a genius, a pioneer. We have a ton to thank him for as photographers. But um, you have to admit that if he was taking pictures today, it would probably be a lot more difficult to uh, become a well-known name. Like if you were a photographer in Ansel Adams' time and you photographed, um, I don't know, Mesa Arch or something like that. That's kind of all it would take. As long as the picture was half decent, that's kind of all it would take to cement you into the, the annals of history and photography. So few things, especially in the West, had been photographed and been photographed well that you kind of just needed to be decent at photography to be a recognizable photographer. Photography was so new. Um, those parts of the world uh, were so unknown to most of the world that it wasn't that difficult to create something unique. Um, again, I'm not disparaging Ansel Adams. Uh, he was lucky to be taking pictures in that time, but also he was an amazing artist, an amazing photographer, an amazing technician in the darkroom. But it does make it kind of difficult for us uh, in this modern time. Um, and you know, play me a tiny violin. I know it's not that, it's nothing to complain about and be sad about. Uh, we are fortunate in a million and one ways. It's just, you know, when there's no secrets left, it can be hard to feel like you're uh, putting something new out there with your work. Um, so what does this mean for us, you know, going forward? Like what's the remedy for this? Uh, for me, it's to redistribute all wealth amongst everyone so that uh, everyone owns everything and then it's all equal. I'm kidding. Um, what's the remedy? Uh, personally, I feel that 
in the modern age of photography, it's very unlikely you'll ever be known for a single image or even a dozen images. Uh, you know, back in Ansel Adams times, you could take 12 photos that were great and you'd probably be known forever. Um, but in modern times, I feel like it boils down more to a body of work. Uh, you have to take a lot of photos over a long period of time so that people get a sense of who you are as an artist um, from this large picture of a bunch of photos. And you're really not ever really gonna strike with that one amazing shot or you know a dozen good shots. Now the problem with relying on a body of work is it takes time. You have to put in a lot of time. And I don't just mean take a bunch of pictures throughout a year. I mean, it literally takes years because your style has to evolve and people have to be drip fed your photography so that they're understanding what you're about and what you're trying to achieve with your work. And so it takes time, which is difficult uh, because patience is difficult. Um, and also, it often feels like you're not achieving anything when you're pursuing a body of work. Because it's hard to see the forest for the trees when you're in it. You know, you're, you're focusing on one photo at a time. And you're trying to stay true to your artistic self. And you're trying to stay true to what you, what you want to communicate to the world. But you're looking at one letter of one word in a complete novel of what is you. And it's really hard to know if the story is going along as it's supposed to because you're only looking at the one letter of the one word right now. But people outside of it, people outside of the forest are looking at the entire story. And uh, I can say from personal experience, um, and I won't rehash too much that I've covered previously, but I had some very difficult times in my photography where I felt like I was directionless and had no, no uh, clearly defined style and message and all that. And then eventually I kind of worked that out, but it started with me just taking photos that um, excited me in that moment without thinking too much about how it contributed to a larger body of work or whether anyone's going to care about this photo. And what ended up happening, ironically, or maybe predictably, if uh, you understand this stuff better than I do, um, what ended up happening is people started telling me, they, that they started saying things that made me realize they understand me as an artist as a whole, even though I maybe felt like that one image didn't really do it, or maybe I'm not on the right track, or uh, maybe I don't even have a complete concept of what I am uh, trying to accomplish with my photography. People would say things to me that very clearly indicated they get what I'm about, they get what my work is communicating, they get the vibes I'm trying to, uh, to sprinkle throughout the world. So I was focusing on the one individual letter of the one word, but they were seeing the progress of the story. So focusing on a body of work, I think, is uh, the best way to go about this in, in the modern times um, and letting it evolve kind of uh, evolve kind of naturally. And, you know, so how do we pursue a body of work? What's the, what's the actual steps we do in the real world to uh, pursue a body of work and to develop your style? Because um, that's something that comes up a lot, by the way, is uh, people ask, you know, how do you develop a style? How do you um, get your work uh, to be uniquely yours? Um, and I think the only way you can do that it's real simple. Just keep on trucking, baby. Just keep, keep on trucking. Just take the next photo that excites you. That's what's worked most for me. Like even this previously Taco Bell thing I'm working on. I've gone back and forth about, uh, I don't know, 150 times whether this project is worth pursuing, whether anyone's gonna care about it, is it a waste of time? Uh, if I do make a book, would anyone even want it? 
Um, I've gone back and forth 150 times, but I keep coming back to the fact that this excites me. Going out to take these pictures uh, creates a little bit of an excite excitement in me, and so I need to do it. That's all. Don't uh, dissect it any further than that. Don't wonder, like, what are people going to think of this photo? Um, all of that be damned. Especially the, the stupid critiques of, like, what are you really trying to say with this photo? Like, people that bring that up, like, what is the, what's the point of this photo? It's part of a larger body, larger body of work. And also, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say with this photo. Because if I could say it, uh, I wouldn't be a photographer. I'd be a writer. That's why I take pictures, is because the picture says everything I'm trying to say. Um, Ansel Adams had a great, I think I've talked about this before, but Ansel Adams had a great interview where the interviewer was asking him, like, what are you trying to say with your work? And his response was basically like, it's all right there. It's in the photos. That's what I'm trying to say, um, which I think is a perfect response. If I have to explain what the picture's about, then uh, you're not really getting it or maybe the photo isn't good. Uh, it's almost like we all have an inner director, you know? We have a, a, a little Christopher Nolan in us, or a little Steven Spielberg, or in my case, it's Wes Anderson, I guess, because everything I do is symmetrical and centered. Um, but I got a little Wes Anderson in there. He's telling me what to photograph. He's telling me what to do. If I start asking him, are you sure you want to do that? Do you think that's the right call? You know, I'm the, I'm the heavy set uh, key grip off to the side who doesn't know a thing about creativity, but uh, is um, doubting what this uh, visionary director is doing, I need to shut my mouth and uh, move some lights because that's my job. It's uh, Wes Anderson's job to tell me what to photograph. So I just need to listen to him. Um, all right, that might, might have been the ramblings of a madman. I'll be putting out a 35,000 word manifesto soon. Um, I think you're really gonna like my, uh, my prescription to the problem at the end. It involves a lot of murder and bombs. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, go ahead and get yourself some Hibiki Japanese Harmony whiskey if you like whiskey and you got the scratch because this is one hell of a delicious whiskey. But as always, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed my uh, um, you know, stream of consciousness, random ramblings on things that probably only matter to me. But whatever the case, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Cheers. Thank you.